Biden has called for Republicans to honor Ginsburg's last wishes and not consider a nominee for the Supreme Court. But President Donald Trump and Senate controlling Republicans have vowed to replace Ginsburg within the next few weeks. Good morning. I'm Bob Costa, national political reporter for The Washington Post. Joining us is a Republican member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is now front and center as Judge Amy Coney Barrett, President Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court, prepares for hearings this month. And he is the author of a new book on the court, One Vote Away, How a Single Supreme Court Seat Can Change History. Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, welcome back. Thanks, Bob. Good to be with you this morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, Senator, the president has now returned to the White House as he continues to battle the coronavirus. He told Americans to not be afraid of it and, quote, don't let it dominate your lives. Do you agree with his message and how he has described the threat of the virus? Well, look, I'm certainly grateful that, that the pre president appears to have recovered. He seems in good health. Uh, I spoke with him last night, called him shortly after he got to the White House just to ask how he was doing. Uh, and I will say, I, I was glad he sounded strong, he sounded invigorated, and, and that was encouraging because obviously the reports a couple of days ago uh, had suggested that his condition uh, was more serious. Um, in terms of not being, not letting COVID dominate your life, I, I think optimism is always a good message. That doesn't mean you don't treat it seriously. That doesn't mean we don't take uh, serious steps to, to defeat the virus. But I think one of the president's most important responsibilities, any president, uh, is, is to stir the American spirit and encourage us that whatever the obstacle we face, whether it is uh, an enemy, foreign or domestic, or whether it is, uh, in this case, a virus, that, that, that we will overcome it. Senator, if the president's trying to stir the American spirit, as you say, he's also released these highly produced videos about his return to the White House. Do you see those videos as appropriate? Oh, I think it's fine. I mean, this is this is a political season. We're we're a month out from an election. I, I don't think it's it's surprising to see either side putting out what are in effect campaign ads, and you you put a little soaring music behind it, and uh, th that that's the nature of the beast. And and candidates on both sides of the aisle running for office, that's what they do. Your colleague in the Senate from Texas, Senator John Cornyn, he said Monday that President Trump has, quote, let his guard down. He was talking to the Houston Chronicle editorial board. He said the president's rhetoric on the pandemic has created confusion. He's a fellow Texas Republican. Is he correct? You know, I wouldn't put it that way. Um, I, I think the administration has done many excellent things with regard to, to fighting this virus, in many ways extraordinary. I think the most significant early decision made uh, was halting airfare into and out of China. That was done uh, with quite a bit of criticism, including Joe Biden calling it uh, hysterical and xenophobic. Um, that was a step I had urged the president to do. He did that January 31st. I chaired a hearing in the Senate where experts told us that decision saved lives. The president also made the decision to halt uh, flights into and out of Europe. That also was roundly criticized at the time. I think that probably saved lives as well. Uh, I also think the administration did a good job um, marshalling resources on ventilators. The whole world watched in horror, as, as we saw other countries, in particular Italy, uh, their socialized health care could not handle the surge in those who were sick, and, and there were patients being denied ventilators. And I, I spoke with the president multiple times. The administration leaned mm -hmm. in, used the Defense Production Act, and, and we did not have shortages of vent ventilators. So I think all of those were good decisions. I also think the efforts expediting uh, production of a vaccine, I'm hopeful, uh, will produce a vaccine that is safe and effective. There were, there were also aspects that the administration didn't do well, which in any crisis, that's going to be the case. The, the most notable example of that was early on the rollout of the test. The rollout of the test 
uh, was not nearly as good as it should have been. Initially, when, when the tests were rolled out, uh, the CDC tried to do it in-house, tried to do it entirely as a government operation, and the lab they were using to pre prepare the test had a contaminant in it. And so the first test they rolled out didn't work. Um, you know, I think the administration fairly quickly corrected that problem and, and, and they gave the regulatory approvals for private labs to develop tests, thing, things like the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic and universities. And I think we've seen tests become much more widespread. So as you look at any crisis, there's going to be aspects that are done well, aspects that are not. But I think overall, the administration has done taken remarkable steps. And, and as a country, we've all taken remarkable right. steps Senator to fight the pandemic. Senator, another part of this crisis is economic. Are you encouraging congressional leaders, Republican leaders to pass another stimulus bill before the election? Well, I, I don't think we're going to. And I, I've said for a couple of months that, that, that nothing was going to pass because, in my judgment, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer don't want anything to pass. That, that, that I think Schumer and, and Pelosi have made a, a, a very cynical political determination that maximizing economic pain is, is in their political self-interest, that, that if millions of Americans are on election day home alone and unemployed and pissed off and broke, that, that they believe that benefits Joe Biden. Um, and, and so throughout the negotiations, it's been my judgment, Pelosi and Schumer were not going to allow anything to pass. Now, I think we should be passing legislation. I introduced legislation called the Recovery Act, which is focused on what we should be focused on. The number one economic agenda should be reopening the economy, helping small businesses reopening, getting people back to work. The Recovery Act is comprehensive legislation designed to cut taxes, cut regulations, help the millions of small businesses that are just now opening their doors, help them to survive and not go under. But unfortunately, Senate and House Democrats don't, don't have any interest in passing anything that provides any relief before Election Day. Beyond the virus, beyond the economy, the court, the subject of your new book, is at the center of this campaign. But the, the announcement for Judge Barrett last weekend has now been linked to many cases of the coronavirus, including two members of your committee, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Are the hearings now going to be virtual? My understanding is the hear hearings are going to be a hybrid. So Judge Barrett will be there in person. I think most of the members of the committee uh, will be there in person. If an individual member wants to be virtual, they can. Uh, that's something we've done a lot. We've had, I think the, the number is 150 virtual or hybrid hearings since since COVID started. Uh, and so that's that's the, the, the plan with judiciary is to go ahead uh, the same way. Will you personally be there or will you participate remotely? Well, I'm right now on, on COVID quarantine. So I'm sitting here, you know, at my DC apartment, actually very grumpy to be honest, Bob, because Heidi and the girls are home in Houston and, and I am not seeing my wife and I'm not seeing my kids, which just makes me kind of just unhappy because I, but the reason I'm quarantining is that one of the people who tested positive, unfortunately, was Senator Mike Lee. Um, and, and Mike was Your sick. Close for, he, he's, Mike is by far my closest friend in the Senate. And, and he was sick. I mean, COVID was, he, he was hurting. He's feeling better now. So I'm encouraged that Mike, Mike had a couple of days where he felt really bad and now he's feeling better. Um, I spent quite a bit of time with Mike. And so the, the Capitol physician, his advice uh, was for me to quarantine. I, I was tested on Friday. I tested negative and I feel healthy. I have no symptoms and I've tested negative, but out of an abundance of caution, I'm quarantining anyway because I don't want to endanger anyone else's health and safety. This is, uh, I guess, the third quarantine I've done throughout this pandemic. You haven't been tested since Friday. Will you be tested at any point this week? I'm sure I will at some point, and and before I go back in into the Senate, I think I'll I'll, I'll go back and take another test. Uh, the quarantine, the timing of the quarantine, ends on the 13th. So I think for me, for participation in the hearing, uh, the first two days I'll probably be virtual, and then I'll be in person from that point on. Uh, but I'll I'll go and do another test. But I've been talking with with physicians on a regular basis, and I mean I feel 
healthy and fine other than you know not being able to get out of the apartment i'm pacing back and forth in my living room trying it's really hard to get 10,000 steps you know in a, in a one bedroom apartment and uh actually two bedroom apartment but the uh, the other bedroom i don't use um and, and and I gotta say, so yesterday my dinner was hamburger helper because I don't I can't cook much, and, and it was fairly pitiful me standing there in shorts, um, frying up hamburger helper. I was sort of laughing with Heidi, going, ah, the glamorous life of a senator. Sounds like the glamorous life of a single reporter. I know the feeling. But Senator <laughs> Senator Lee is a close friend of yours. Uh, does he believe that he contracted the coronavirus from his appearance at the White House at the Coney Barrett announcement? You know, I don't know. I, I haven't asked Mike where he thought he caught it. And, uh, you know, with a, with a virus like this, I'm not sure anyone necessarily knows for sure, given that there's a latency period. Um, you know, you can figure out possible places where there was risk. Obviously, the number of people uh, who caught it at, at the Rose Garden announcement is is disturbing and certainly suggests that people caught it there. And, and look, I, I don't think you can ever eliminate risk entirely and and fighting a pandemic there's a reason the entire world is is battling to fight this pandemic and and it's serious and that's why we've taken such extraordinary steps to combat it did president trump in your conversation with him offer any guidance on where he believes the virus started in his inner circle you know he didn't um he said he said he was feeling really bad the, the first day or two i think when he went to walter reed um, he said it was kind of like it felt like the flu, like he was just he was tired and he said it felt like the flu. And I, I was just encouraged. I called him last night just to say, hey, how are you doing? Um, and what I was most encouraged is not even what he said, but just his voice. He sounded strong and energetic. He didn't sound. I mean, I, look, I was worried. Anyone should be worried when when the president is sick and, and he sounded quite healthy. So I was encouraged by that. And one last point on Senator Lee. Do you believe he will participate in the Coney Barrett hearings because, as you said, he's feeling better? Yeah, I'm confident Mike will participate. My, I'm sure he'll follow the doctor's guidance. So I don't know if, if some or all of that participation will be virtual. But, but I'm, I I'm don't think a team of horses could keep Mike away from the hearing. Should, uh, should Chairman Graham have started these hearings sooner? Uh, some of my sources on your committee say Senator Graham was trying to wait until the proper time to start these hearings in mid-October. But there's so many variables out there right now. I just wonder, as a reporter, are Republicans grumbling behind the scenes about waiting until mid-October to begin these hearings? Yeah, not really. I mean, we had a meeting of Judiciary Committee Republicans early on before the schedule was announced. And then Lindsey laid out to us what his plan was. And so he told us he was planning to start on the 12th. Uh, and several of us asked, so why delay? And what Lindsay said is he was trying to follow historical practice, and that was consistent with the timing of, of many past Supreme Court hearings, uh, giving nearly two weeks between the announcement and the commencement of the hearing. And he wanted to do as much as possible consistent with and following the historical precedent. I, I understood that. The, the, the one thing I pressed back on Lindsay, and I actually talked with with the Senate lawyers, both Lindsay's lawyers and Mitch McConnell's lawyers and my lawyers about procedurally, what I think is critical is that the Senate confirm Judge Barrett before election day. I think it's very important for the country that we have a fully functioning Supreme Court with nine justices come election day. And so I wanted to make sure if we started on the 12th that running the clock out, you know, you can anticipate that Senate Democrats are gonna pull every procedural trick in the book and, and some pretty creative things to try to delay matters. And, and so I wanted to make sure that, that we would have sufficient timing to get the confirmation completed before election day. Um, all of the parliamentary experts we talked to felt confident that no matter what shenanigans they pulled, that we would, we would have sufficient time to get the job done uh, by election day. And so given that, I think it's fine that we're starting on Monday. When you look at the hearings, a lot can happen. But how confident are you right now that Senate Republicans have the votes to confirm Judge Barrett? I'm very confident. I, I believe we have the votes. I believe we'll get it done. Um, as you know, two Republicans have publicly expressed concern 
uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. Um, assuming they vote no, and I don't know that either one is actually put in concrete that they'll vote no, uh, but even if they vote no, as I see it, we have a solid 51 votes right now. And, and from the conversations in the conference, um, I, I don't see that changing. I, I think people are enthusiastic. I think Judge Barrett is a very strong nominee. You know, I sat down with her, I guess, two weeks ago at the Capitol and met with her and and her academic credentials are are right. impeccable they're very strong but but what i was most impressed with uh was her demeanor her demeanor is is very calm it's very scholarly it's very much a judicial temperament and and i think that will serve her well um i tried to prepare her for some of the what I expect to be something of a circus, um, much like we I, saw. I, I heard you told her to be boring. I, th that is my advice to just about every nominee. I think it's the best advice to any nominee is is making headlines is never good. Just just uh, quietly answer the questions and do your job. Do you believe she will be boring? Uh, I think she will be substantive and scholarly, and 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 I was encouraged. She just she didn't, you know. You think about it. A month ago, this woman was a law professor and and federal judge in Indiana. She could go walk in the park, and nobody knew who she was. And in the last month, the entire world has descended upon her. She's in the middle of this maelstrom of of political and press attacks, and and. You know, that's a pretty intense transformation. And, and I was encouraged uh, just by the peacefulness. Now, look, she's she's a mom of seven, so I guess she's used to some some chaos at home. I, Heidi and I have our hands full with two girls, so seven I can't imagine. But but I was really very impressed by by how she approached it. And I expect her to be calm. We may see Senate Democrats have have a Spartacus moment where where they, attack her and 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 malign her but but i expect her to be unfazed and and calm throughout and i think well, based on the substance I, I think she'll get confirmed so the the demeanor is one aspect of the hearings to be sure the other question is going to be her specificity when it comes to certain questions and you write a lot in your book about all these legal battles that are shaping the court and one thing that comes through is the question of precedent legal precedent and, and a question that's often asked during Supreme Court confirmation hearings is, where does a nominee stand on whether Brown versus the Board of Education was rightly decided? And, and, and your view is that if a nominee answers that question, they're opening up themselves to questions about precedent on a range of issues, including Roe versus Wade and abortion rights. Do yep. you believe Judge Barrett will respond to a question on precedent on Brown versus Board? You know, I don't know. Um, when I met with her, I actually discussed this issue, but I didn't ask her what her answer was to the question. What what I told her when I met with her is at this point, I've been through a couple of hundred confirmation hearings with, with judicial candidates. And a question that is routinely asked, not of every nominee, but of a lot of nominees, is do you agree with Brown versus Board of Education? And And I've seen nominees who say yes, and I've seen nominees who decline to answer, and and it goes on one of two paths. If if you um, if you decline to answer, you, the nominee gets beaten over the head with what kind of radical are you that you're not even willing to say you agree with Brown versus Board of Education? You've got to be some crazy extremist, and and that's look. Those can be kind of some some rough attacks that are directed at nominees. On the other hand. If you say yes, the reason that question is being asked, no, nobody seriously expects any of the nominees to disagree with Brown. But Brown, they're asking about Brown because they want to very quickly go down the slippery slope and say, okay, if you answered about Brown, what about Roe? What about Obergefell? What about Heller? What about- Are, are those fair questions though, Senator? You're on the committee. Should nominees answer that question or not? No, uh, I, which, I'm sorry, which question? There were several there, so which- Well, no, I'm, um, I'm saying- you're on the committee. If you if you're listening to that question being asked, do you actually want to hear an answer on precedent as a U.S. senator on those on either Brown or Roe? So what I what I told Judge Barrett, I don't know what she'll say because I didn't ask her and I didn't ask her what her answer would be. I just talked through 
with her my observations of how different nominees have approached it. And, and I said, you know, it was my judgment that it's worked out better for nominees when they go ahead and answer the question about Brown and say, yes, absolutely, it was rightly decided, and then be prepared to cut off the slippery slope because no nominee worth his or her salt, no judicial nominee should answer a question about how he or she would decide a case that may well appear before them as, as a judge or justice. So it would be wrong for any justice to, or potential justice to answer the question, how would you rule on Roe? It would be wrong for them to answer the question, how would you rule on Heller? Both of those are issues that are actively litigated, that are regularly on the docket, that, that as a justice, they could very well be called to decide upon. What I shared, in my view, Brown is a, is a different, uh, different issue altogether. Brown was unanimous. Brown is undisputed. There's no litigation challenging Brown. Everyone agrees Brown was rightly decided. It's one of the seminal decisions in our country's history. Um, and I think there's a difference between saying, you know, look, another example yeah, I'd probably say yes yeah. to is, is Marbury versus Madison. I, I have no beef with Marbury. Marbury rightly decided one of the foundations uh, of our jurisprudence. And and look, line, line line drawing can be difficult, but but the basic line is under judicial ethics. A judicial nominee should not predecide an issue uh, that may well come before them. And I, I think there's a difference between something under active litigation right now versus something that has been uh, universally acclaimed for decades or or centuries. If Judge Barrett is confirmed, Senator Cruz, and the court becomes a six to three conservative majority. Do you believe Roe versus Wade could be overturned in your lifetime? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with the premise that the court would be a six three conservative majority. Um, one of the things I write about in, in my book, um, so the book, One Vote Away, each chapter talks about a different constitutional liberty. and and it, it goes in depth, and what it does is tell war stories, tell stories about uh, landmark cases at the U.S. Supreme Court that, that, that I helped litigate, and it tries to bring, uh, bring the reader behind the curtain, understand what's going on at the Supreme Court, who the justices are. But in the book, I talk quite a bit about, number one, John Roberts. I, I've known John for, for 25 years. I consider him a friend. Um, John was a law clerk to Chief Justice William Rehnquist, as was I. John clerked before I did, but but we've been you friends along. You dedicated the book to the former Chief Justice. I, I, I did, to Chief Justice Rehnquist, my, my boss and friend. Um, I've been very, very disappointed by John Roberts' tenure. And, and in the book, I'm, I'm quite candid in, in detailing why. Um, you think, I think he's part of the liberal wing of the court? I think, I think John Roberts has become the new Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, I think this last term, uh, he had a series of decisions where he just galloped to the left. And, and I gave a, a Senate floor speech um, denouncing them, and it, and, it, and it made me sad to do so. I still consider John a friend, but, but I, you know, we all remember his confirmation hearing where he gave one of the most famous articulations of what the role of a judge is. And he said, a judge is supposed to be like an umpire where you just call balls and strikes and, and you don't favor either team. And, and I think in, in the last couple of years, John has, has stopped being an umpire and he's put on one team's uniform and he's picked up the bat and he's swinging as hard as he can. And, and I think that uh, that is inconsistent with his oath and, and, and with the promise he made to the American people. In the final few minutes here, Senator, let's turn to the campaign. How worried are you that Texas could turn blue and and vote for Vice President Biden? I, I'm worried. I, I think Texas is a real battleground. Um, I don't believe that will happen. I, th I think Trump will win Texas. I think John Cornyn will get reelected in Texas. But, but Texas is a real battleground. And, and it's, um, you know, if you look at 2018 in, in my reelection, uh, Democrats in Texas more than doubled their turnout in Texas. They took it from 1.8 million to 4 million. That is a staggering increase in an off-year election. Now, thankfully, we turned out 4.2 million Republicans, and, and 0.2 was our margin of victory. Um, the challenge with Texas, and it's a challenge nationally, 
uh, is that Texas is a very suburban state. Our population is heavily in the suburbs surrounding the big cities and the suburbs nationally uh, have all turned purple. Um, blue collar working class voters, union members are moving right. That's moving the Midwest more Republicans. The president does well with blue collar working class voters, but suburban voters and in particular suburban women have been moving left and that's the challenge in Texas, that's the challenge in Georgia, that's the challenge in Arizona, uh, is that as Republicans, we've got to do better uh, making the case to, to suburban women in particular as to why free enterprise, rule of law, the constitution, why that matters. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book, One Vote Away, is, is, is for a voter right now who may be undecided in the election, who may not like some of the things Donald Trump does, the book is designed to, to, to explain, okay, here are the stakes. If you care about free speech or religious liberty or the second amendment, if you care about democracy and elections, here are all of the fundamental rights that have been decided 5-4 by the court that are just one vote away from being lost. For me, that's the most compelling reason to vote for Donald Trump, and I hope people who read the book, it will at least help them make an, an informed decision uh, in the election as well. And you write all in the book, uh, we don't have time to discuss it today, about how you came to your decision to endorse President Trump because of the court. But another yeah. reason many conservatives backed President Trump in 2016 was not only the court, which was a central issue, but the nomination of vice president, uh, the nominee, Governor Pence at the time, to be on the ticket. He has his debate now with your colleague, Senator Harris, in Salt Lake City this week. As a former debater, what's your advice to VP Pence in terms of how to take on Senator Harris? I think the vice president's going to do very well. Uh, I think four years ago, uh, Pence beat Tim Kaine. I think he performed substantially better than, than Tim did in the debate. Four years ago, I think Tim made a mistake and then he came out really hot. I mean, he was he was attacking Mike and he, he was, it was odd because Tim is a, a very affable guy. I get along very well with Tim. We've worked, we've passed legislation together, but but in that debate, he came out just guns firing, and I think Mike was substantive and affable and, and outperformed his opponent in that debate. I hope the same thing will happen in his debate against Kamala. Um, I, I, I think very highly of Mike Pence. Uh, I think he is a good man. He is a decent man. Uh, Kamala is a very talented politician. Uh, she can be charming. Uh, I expect her to be aggressive. I expect her to be aggressive, but probably not as obviously mean and hostile as as Tim Kaine was, and and that'll benefit her. But but I think Pence will be calm and substantive. And and what I hope he does, and this has been my advice to both Pence and Trump, is focus on issues and the substance and and contrasting the competing visions for the country. I think if this election is a battle between the blessings of free enterprise and and socialism and 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 government control of the economy, I think we win. I think if it's a battle between the rule of law and the Constitution and Bill of Rights on one hand and anarchy and riots in the street, I think we win. I think the Democrats have made the decision they want this election to be a personality contest. They want it to be a referendum on whether or not you like Donald J. Trump. And I think they think they win that. I don't know if they do or not, but I'm confident if we focus on substance, we do win. And so that would be my advice is to be to, to, to the vice president, is to be a happy warrior and focus on substance. Senator Cruz, last question here. Uh, when you visited Washington Post Live for an interview a few months ago, we, we talked about 2024. But after reading your book, I have to wonder whether you're actually interested in ever serving or being nominated to, to serve on the Supreme Court. It seems like every time the subject comes up, you bring up your friend, Senator Mike Lee. Is it fair to say you just don't have interest in, in being a Supreme Court nominee in your career? So that, that, that is fair to say, and it's one of the things I talk about at, at great length in the book is, is with all three Supreme Court vacancies that have occurred under President Trump, he and I have had serious conversations about the vacancies and, and starting with the first one, the Scalia vacancy, where in November of 2016, 
I spent four and a half hours with the president and his team in Trump Tower, and, and the president leaned in pretty hard on the Scalia vacancy, asking if I would be interested in it. Um, and I told him no. I said flat out, I don't want the job. Um, and, and I detail in the book how that decision in particular, in November 2016, I wrestled with, I agonized over. You know, I knew Justice Scalia pretty well. He, he was someone who, who I revered. Um, I mean, he was truly a legend. And, and, and to even have it be a real possibility to succeed someone like Justice Scalia, it took your breath away. And, and I spent a couple of weeks really thinking about it, talking with my family about it, um, praying about it. And, and I came to a piece that I don't want the job. And, and so I had the conversation again when the second vacancy occurred. And I detail in the book this summer, I, I was visiting my in-laws out in California uh, and we were water skiing and, it, and um, I was standing on the boat dock. I was wearing you know, swimsuits and flip flops and, and the president calls me on, on my cell phone and says, Ted, I'm, I'm putting together a new Supreme Court list. Um, and, and, and he said, you know, is it OK if, if, if I include you on the list? Is it all right with you? And, and I told him, Mr. President, if it's helpful to have me on the list, sure, I'm happy to be on the list. If that's beneficial, great, you can put me on the list. But I don't want the job and I wouldn't take it. And, and I was unequivocal each of the three times. And you know, Bob, a lot of people find that a, a weird thing for me to say, given my background, given how much of my life I've spent litigating in front of the Supreme Court, why I wouldn't want to be a justice. And the reason- well, Because I think you still want to be president of the United States. I think you may want to run in 2024. Well, and I want to be in the political fight. A, a, a justice stays out of political fights and policy fights. And if I were ever a judge, I would stay out of those fights. I don't want to stay out of those fights. I, I'll give you a great example. One of the chapters in the book is about school choice. I, I'm passionate about school choice. I think it is the civil rights issue of the next century. Now, I don't think it would be appropriate for the Supreme Court to mandate school choice, to order that we have school choice nationwide. As much as I care about it, it's not a judge's job to decide it. The right place to fight for school choice is in the elected legislatures, is in Congress, is in the state legislatures. Now, unfortunately, as I detail in the book, there four justices have voted to strike down essentially every school choice program in America. The left wants to use the court to shut down school choice, which would destroy opportunity for struggling inner city kids. I think that's inappropriate, but I want to fight for school choice. And if I'm going to fight for school choice, the place to do it is the Senate. Um, and, and actually, why I don't want to serve in the court is illustrated right now with the fight over confirming uh, Judge Barrett, I, I am working to lead the fight in the Senate to get her confirmed. And th this is not an easy fight. There, there's going to be a lot of incoming on the other side. And I think we need principled constitutional fighters in the Senate. I think it's a major battlefield. And so I'm very happy with 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 the opportunity I have to to, to fight on behalf of 29 million Texans. Senator Cruz, that's all the time we have. Appreciate you stopping by Washington Post Live. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And let me encourage folk. The, the books is on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's anywhere you get your books. Uh, we made number one on Amazon. So even if you don't necessarily agree with me, I'd encourage you to check it out and it may give you an insight uh, into the into what's going on at the court, what the stakes are at the court, what the stakes are in the Barrett hearing and, and, and what the stakes are in, in this upcoming election. We'll be keeping an eye on those hearings. Thanks again, Senator. And stay with Washington Post Live today because there are some great events coming up, including 1 p.m. today. My colleague Eugene Scott, he'll be here to discuss America's digital transformation with Joanna Coles and Scott Galloway. At 3 p.m., Jim Clapper, the former director of national intelligence, will be with David Ignatius for a voting disinformation program. So 1 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Eastern today, two terrific events for Washington Post Live. Make sure to tune in to them. But for now, thanks very much for joining this conversation and stopping by this morning.